Hey, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Real Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Knudsen. So we'll all start off with the Florida Gators. And, of course, they go into Baton Rouge and lose 49-42 to against LSU. LSU was so thrilled with the, the, with the win that they end up firing uh, or parting ways with Coach O. Um, fantastic article in The Athletic by Brody Miller, if you haven't checked it out yet, by the way. Uh, good, good stories there. The good, good reporting by Mr. Miller there. Um, but Coach O, a lot of off the field problems going on. This, this deal was in the works. Really had nothing to do with the Gator game on Saturday, and uh, you could see why they maybe want to get ahead of it and announce it. They had the experience with Les Miles, I believe it was in 2015, where they, it was really talked about that he was about to get fired for half the season. Then he ends up going on a tear the second half of the season, saving his job, coming back next year, ultimately getting fired, which led to Coach O stepping in as the interim coach. So LSU hasn't conducted a full-on national uh, coaching search since hiring Miles after the departure of Nick Saban after the 2000, I believe, 2004 season. Um, so New times for the Tigers. So going to miss Coach O there out at LSU. Love the Go Tigers stuff. He was the king of Louisiana for a minute, but sounds like all that power went to his head and he'll have to regroup a little bit. But on to the game. We talked about it a lot on Stand Up and Holler. Highly encourage you if you want to hear the details of, of what I thought about the Florida LSU game. Everything is on Stand Up and Holler. However, just the short things, it's time for Grantham to go. That's that's the, the cliff notes is uh, – Look, I, I know the, the offense, you could blame the offense on 21 points. 49 points scored by LSU, 21 directly linked to the offense. Of course, you had the pick six. You had the two interceptions in the first half, which set up short fields, extremely short fields, like around the 20-yard line. It's tough to stop. Tough tough to stop if you're the defense. However, maybe come through one of the two. I'm not, we're not asking you to do everything. It's really the second half would bother me. Anthony Richardson comes in and just looks like the unbelievable talent that we all think he could be. And he gets you back in the game. But time and again, you only came up with one stop that mattered. They forced a punt at one point, which allowed Richardson and the offense to go down the field and tie it. But you couldn't come up with a single other stop. And, and really, they were just getting beat by the same play over and over again. The counter play, which you really didn't see till the end of the third, first quarter, but ends up being the play of the day. And LSU runs it to perfection. No adjustments from the defense. And it just it leaves us in a place where we go, what are we doing here? What are we doing? And, and I, it's starting to feel the criticism of Mullen is, is ramped up to – it's been ramped up throughout the offseason about him being more reactive than proactive at times with some of these decisions. It's hard. I I, I like Mullen. I, I think I think Mullen's a good coach. I think Mullen has transformed this program offensively, but he seems slow to make big decisions at times, which there's times where that can be good, but there's times where it's not a tough decision to make at times where you need to go. I I appreciate the guy's got loyalty, but there there needs to be a limit to that. There needs to be a limit to where loyalty needs to be attached to performance as well. Like you can have loyalty, stick with a guy through a rough game or two. Like, hey, Todd Grantham, you had a rough 2020. Go get him in 2021, turn things around. We're seeing the same traits though in 2021. Alabama SEC championship game. Bama opens up five straight touchdowns to score. Five straight touchdowns. Five straight drives with touchdowns to start the game in the first half. 35 points in the first half. Have fun coming back against Alabama. That's always fun. What do we do in the swamp this year? 21 straight points. Again, uh, uh, interception set up a short field. Defense a lot of touchdown again on that. So you'd say that's a tough spot. What about when we went to Kentucky and we we were the team that got the interception? We we go down deep into Kentucky territory. Their defense stood up and then promptly blocked the field goal, returned it for a touchdown. It's the difference in the game. So it's cap it, defenses are capable of making this happen. Mullen is talented enough to overcome what Grantham puts on the field. Eight out of 12 games, easy a year. Mullen can do it. But in the times, the four games a year, you really need that defense where you really need Grantham to step up on a drive. It just hasn't been happening. And we've seen enough at this point. And so I, I really hope that the move happens in season here. I'm losing hope that it's going to happen before the Georgia game. But 
if if we go out and Georgia does, you know, if if we're up by three in the fourth quarter against Georgia, one drive to go for the Bulldogs. Defense needs a couple of the stand. Do you believe that the Gators are making that stop? Based on evidence so far, likely no. So that's where I'm at with it. So I just the confidence is shot in, in his ability to put on a defense that's going to be a championship level defense. Mullen has proven twice now in 2020 and 2021. I think with Anthony Richardson coming to the forefront here, this is a championship level offense now. I think he's a little slow. There's a the quarterback position. I can understand and have more empathy for slow playing the quarterback position. Look, you saw the two interceptions that Anthony Richardson threw. They they weren't the they weren't the brightest plays. All right. So Mullins in practice, he's probably seeing this guy. He probably makes mistakes on reads. We don't know what checks he's missing. We don't know how well he reads defenses yet. We don't know any of that stuff. Dan Mullen knows all that though. And and I think that you look at Richardson in the limited time we've seen him and we go, wow, that guy's an amazing talent. And it's easy for us to see, but maybe Emory just has a much greater command of all that stuff. So that's why Mullen might be slower to make that decision. I'm just trying to empathize here. I'm trying to understand what Mullen's thinking. With Emory Jones, though, if you're going to hold that job being the t- lesser talent, why did Chris Leak start over Tim Tebow in 2006? Was he a better quarterback? Not in terms of talent-wise. I mean, you could argue maybe he had a better arm in some situation, but, I mean, Tebow was clearly the rising star in that situation. Tebow comes in. He's the perfect fit for Urban Meyer's offense. Chris Leak, a little bit of an awkward fit for that system. But Leak, you could trust him. He, he made steady plays. He was just a real steady dude. The offense was something that they could build, you know, put some things around him to where maybe he's not going to run it the way Tebow did, which we saw how Tebow ran it. We know Leak what didn't have the ability to run it the way Tebow did, but you could kind of manage with Leak. And, and Leak was an intelligent guy who could put it in the right spots and everything. With Emory Jones, you're still seeing – you could point to the two Anthony Richardson interceptions like I did and say, hey, those were kind of dumb throws by a young quarterback. He probably should have made either one of those throws that he made. But Emory Jones making the same mistakes. So you're not getting that veteran guy who's keeping the ball in like safe for you. He's not, he's not, he's making as many mistakes as Anthony Richardson because he saw Richardson in that second half, in that comeback. They had the three and out where the LSU DB went and posed over uh over the receiver. I think it was Copeland or Shorter after one of the routes on third down and ends up getting a personal foul to continue the drive. But after that, Richardson just exploded. He looks super comfortable making reads, allowing him to actually run the full breadth of the offense versus just coming in to run a few plays here and there where the defense can creep up. That makes the offense so much more electric. And I I think we saw – I don't think – I think the cat's out of the bag with this one. I don't think Mullen can go back at this point. Although it would be very, it would be a very bold thing if every Jones came out and started the Georgia game. I don't even want to put that in the universe. I hope it doesn't happen. But I think there's a role for Emory Jones on this team. I, I I'll tell you what I saw with Emory Jones. I, I, when when Richardson came out with that injury and Jones stepped in on that third and thirteen and just dialed up a pass right over the middle, kept the drive going. The guy didn't miss a beat. He kept his helmet on the whole time. He looked genuine. He didn't look like he was faking anything. He wasn't sulking. That's tough. If you're Jones, he's waited his turn. In the era of the transfer portal, he has waited his turn. But this is the University of Florida. You could say you wait your turn, but then when you get your turn, time to perform. He hasn't done it to the level of which the guy behind him can do it. Tough tough situation. We saw Jalen Hurts deal with the same thing. Jalen Hurts, starting quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, lost his job in college. Ends up transferring to little old Oklahoma and leading them to the college football playoffs. So, look, Emory Jones next year, maybe he could be leading another program to the playoff for all we know. But this guy Richardson, he's the real deal. And 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 now with three losses, if we're not investing completely in 2022, then I have no idea what we're doing the rest of the season. Everything should be about making that run in 2022 because you got the guy at quarterback now. You got that guy at quarterback. So fix the defense up a little bit. 
it, with M, with Anthony Richardson and Dan Mullen, you don't need a perfect defense. You just need an okay defense. Look at that LSU defense in 2019. It wasn't the best defense ever, but when Joe Burrow is running up points left and right, hey, can you hold him to like 20 or less? <laughs> like just maybe, maybe even like 28. Just hold him under 28 for us. We got gotcha. you. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how Mullen proceeds with the situation overall. I would like to see Grantham gone sooner than later at this point. I don't think it's a question anymore. I think it's just a matter of when and not if. And I'm hoping Anthony Richardson's got that full-time gig. Maybe Emory Jones can be used in, in a couple packages, come in to spell Richardson. Maybe Richardson doesn't have to, have to take those big hits on third and short. Emory's got some skill set there to where he could still be a contributor on this team. But – want to see Richardson out there getting those developmental snaps, allowing him to make the mistakes. It's his turn. It's his turn to make the, to get a shot here. So Florida Gators four and three heading into Georgia week. We've seen them pull these upsets before. This would be a massive one. This would be an absolutely massive one that would upset a lot of Bulldogs fans. So I'm all for it. Kentucky traveling to Georgia. I said it last week. If Kentucky wins this game, do you bump them to number one? Kentucky football at number one, that prospect, it, it seemed far-fetched, and uh turns out it was. Uh, Kentucky, conti- uh, K- Georgia, Georgia continues to impress. They end up notching a 30-13 to win over the Wildcats, and Kentucky was never really a threat in this game. 14-7 to at halftime, you felt like they were hanging around a bit. Uh, there was a key play uh, where, where it got, the some of the Kentucky defenders could have jumped on the football. They thought it was a dead ball. Turns out it wasn't. But Kentucky was held to under 250 yards rushing in this one, or 250 yards of offense, including only 51 yards rushing on 27 attempts. Georgia, they're looking good. It, you know, if they get past this Florida game, we've certainly seen situations in the last 20 to 30 years where the better Georgia team has lost to Florida. So let's not count that out of the realm of possibility. But should the Bulldogs get by the Gators, they have Mizzou, Tennessee, Charleston Southern, and Georgia Tech remaining in the regular season before the SEC title game. Not exactly a murderer's row of games there. We could see them lock up a playoff spot before they even play in Atlanta. You're thinking they're going to end up playing Alabama most likely. I, 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 that's, that's what it's looking like. But almost regardless of who they play, Georgia should be good for a playoff spot. If they if they can get through Florida, that remaining schedule doesn't really scare anybody, I think. So we could – the SEC title game is losing some meaning potentially this year. That will be interesting to watch. Uh, their potential opponent in Atlanta, like I mentioned, the Alabama Crimson Tide, they bounced back in a big way. They went to Starkville. They took out the team, Mississippi State, who had beaten Texas A&M on Kyle Field – the week before Alabama was upset on that very same stadium, in that very same stadium there. But could Nick Saban be any happier with this situation? The, the Tide end up winning 49-9. to He's got their full attention for the rest of the season. Uh, they're going to be fueled. It, it's going to be no problem getting this team to pay attention. He's got all the talent in the world, and now he's got them locked in. And I expect them to be – ultra on point for the rest of the season. I, and this is a Mississippi State team losing by 40. You might go, well, they're outmatched. They've been very competitive this season. And like I said, they beat that A&M team the week before Bama went in there and lost to that same same team. So the Bulldogs, they end up being held to negative one yards rushing. Not the best look there. Bama was ruthless in this one. They went 12 of 16 on third downs, four touchdowns from Bryce Young. And talk about Georgia all you want. But I'm still betting on Saban here in the SEC title game. You might have to see him twice in the playoffs. We might be headed toward a Georgia-Alabama uh, rematch in the national title game. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But uh, it's looking more and more like it. Saban, Bama, rolling at this point. Uh, to me, the most entertaining game of the day on Saturday was Ole Miss going into Knoxville to play the Tennessee Volunteers. Of course, you got the return of Lane Kiffin. Neyland Stadium, checker Neyland. That was a big movement. They finally got the checkerboard pattern in the stadium with all the fans. It looked awesome. It was rocking. I mean, I, I'm no Tennessee fan here, but it was rocking in the return of Lane Kiffin. And it kind of helps when the team's actually playing some competent football. For all those people who are so down on the Josh Heupel hire, wait until this guy gets 
gets a quarterback that can complete downfield passes. I think Hendon Hooker has played very well this season, but his forte is not taking deep shots down the field. I am very interested to see what that offense at, at Tennessee will look like once Heupel gets his man uh, it, at the quarterback position. But you're seeing Heupel instill some hope into a really beleaguered fan base. And, and the whole night you were just looking at that going, wow, that looks like Rocky Top looks like itself again. They finally snapped out of it. Look, They look good. They look good on TV here. And then there's a bad call, end of the game. Officials say that, that the Tennessee receiver did not make the line of scrimmage or did not make the first down. Tennessee fans disagreed, kind of went crazy, threw bottles. Threw, you saw mustard bottles. You saw golf balls going to Lane Kiffin, all types of stuff. Not a good look. Tennessee ends up getting fined 250 grand, but fiery night on Rocky Top. And overall, I, I think it so kind of mars a, it, it mars a, a good scene that was there the whole night. But uh, interesting to see Tennessee come to life a little bit and Ole Miss escaping in this one. Ole Miss, on the other hand, they stay alive in that SEC West race. Should Bama stumble one more time, Ole Miss might be that team up in Atlanta playing Georgia this year. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, another team out West that, that's been hanging tough and kind of being sneaky a little bit here, the Auburn Tigers. They go into Arkansas. They get a big win, 38-23 to 23 over the Razorbacks. The Razorbacks were everybody's uh, early season darling. I, I, I really haven't heard anyone say a bad word about Sam Pittman in that program out of Arkansas. I think a lot of people like what's going on out there. But a sack and a fumble in the end zone put Auburn up 21-17 to 17 midway through the third quarter. And the Tigers, they never looked back, pulling out an impressive 38-23 win on the road in Fayetteville. Auburn uh, quarterback Bo Nix was outstanding in this one, 21 of 26 for 292 yards. This is a guy who's been very up and down throughout his career. Started placement, we saw him play well at Auburn. Nice, nice win here, too. Harson quietly improves to 5-2 and two in his rookie season at Auburn. Uh, the Tigers hit a bye week before hosting Ole Miss on October 30th. So the Rebels got some big games coming up, too. Texas A&M, no hangover for the Aggies. They go up to Columbia. They take care of Mizzou, 35-14. Uh, they streaked out. The Aggies streaked out to a 21-0 lead before leaning on the run game. End up racking up close to 300 yards, 283 rushing on the day. Uh, it really cruised in this one. Not much to report here. Mizzou. Falls again in a big game. Uh, good win for the Aggies on the road. South Carolina, 21, Vanderbilt, 20. Two early touchdowns for Carolina. Put them up 14-3 to three in the first quarter. But the Gamecocks did not score again until the final drive. Luke Doty, quarterback for the Gamecocks, dealing with some ankle issues, I believe. Uh, he, he had to be pulled before the final drive. And Zeb Nolan, the, the one-time graduate assistant who decided to end up – he ended up playing this season, got some starts early in the season, down 20-14. to 14. He comes in the game on the final drive, leads an eight-play, 75-yard drive in 59 seconds, completes an eight-yard touchdown to Xavier Leggett with 37 seconds remaining to secure the Gamecocks, uh, their first SEC win under Frank Beamer. Let's go to the ACC. Clemson sneaks by Syracuse 17-14 on Friday night. Hughes missed a 48-yard field goal with 38 seconds left to allow Clemson to escape with a three-point victory in this one. Uh, the Tigers continuing to struggle. That offense is not pretty right now. Uh, they passed for under 200 yards, and they rushed for only 116. Clemson controls its own destiny still. I, a lot of people have written off this Clemson team with two losses. They're out of the playoff hunt. So a lot of people aren't thinking about Clemson, but within the ACC, they only have that loss to NC State. Their other loss, of course, was the opener to Georgia. And they control their own ACC destiny, but they're going to Pitt, who's looking pretty good in the ACC right now. Go figure on this Pitt team. They're a tough one to project. They, their one loss this season, I believe, is to Western Michigan in the MAC. Uh, but they're undefeated so far in ACC play, only 2-0. But it's, it's still very early. But Pitt's controlling their side of the conference. Let's see if Clemson can stay in control of theirs with the trip to Pitt this weekend. Miami went up to North Carolina. The Tar Heels win 45-42 to in a competitive game. An awkward post-game handshake between former Texas head coach Mac Brown and his defensive coordinator Manny Diaz created more buzz than the actual game itself, I would say, though. 
a uh, little bit of a arm grab on the arm as Diaz is trying to walk away. Diaz has kind of got his head turned. He didn't look like he wanted to be there a whole lot. Uh, UNC bounces back from an ugly loss to Florida State by outpacing a Miami team who really lacks an identity under Diaz. 2021 has been a tough campaign for this Hurricanes team so far. It It's it's a little bit of a bummer for them because with Eric King coming in last year, there's a little bit of hope that – They'd get the offensive side of the ball figured out. But as the offense is kind of picked up, the defense is deteriorated. And at this point, you really have to take a close look at Manny Diaz and what's going on with this Miami program. If you said, has he done anything to move the ball for further from where it was under Rick? You can't say you can't say it's really any different. I mean, it, I, I I think at this point. Miami has to start seriously considering moving on from Coach Diaz, even though he seemed like the perfect fit when he was hired down there. I think his dad was the former mayor of Miami or something. It just seemed like a great fit when he was hired down there, and that defense was cooking when he first came in. But since last year, I really that North Carolina game last year sticks out in my memory, where North Carolina just ran all over Miami. It might be – we might be talking change in Miami pretty soon if this if this trend keeps up. So Miami, keep an eye on that. Another disappointing loss for the Canes in North Carolina. All right, I mentioned the Pitt Panthers. They went into Vatek 28-7 to over the Hokies uh, for Pitt. Pitt, they're, like I said, they're only 2-0 in the ACC, but they are pacing the Coastal Division by two games. Everyone else in the division has two losses already. So they can afford to lose one and still have control over the Coastal Division. But the Panthers, they put away Vatek in this one by three touchdowns. And if they could top Clemson this weekend, you can expect some playoff talk to start to swirl around Pat and Arduzzi's program. They have that one ugly loss, but a one-loss ACC team, you're probably in the hunt this year. That's probably what it is. North Carolina State goes to Boston College, gets a big win, 33-7. to Three TDs in the third quarter uh, buried Boston College in this one. NC State wins its fourth straight to improve to 5-1. and one. The Wolfpack's win over Clemson is looking more and more valuable each week as Clemson continues to sneak by these games. Uh, next up for NC State at Miami versus Louisville and at FSU. Should they survive that stretch, it could set up a very intriguing matchup with Wake Forest on November 13th. And remember, the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, the only undefeated team in the ACC remaining so far here in the heading toward the end of October. Very strange times we're living in. Uh, let's go on to the Big Ten. Michigan State survives a trip to Bloomington. Both of Sparty's touchdowns were set up by interceptions. One pick six and the other return to the Indiana 39-yard line as Michigan State avoids the upset with a 20-15 to win over Indiana in this one. Michigan State heads into the bye week at 7-0 with a matchup against Michigan looming on October 30th in you're thinking it's starting to feel like a special season. Running back Walker, the, the running back Walker, he's, he's in talks for the Heisman. There's good things happening in East Lansing, only in year two of Mel Tucker, but starting to get some shades of 1999 cooking here. LSU, they need a coach, and the rumor has it is that the eye of the Tiger is heavy upon East Lansing once again. Of course, Nick Saban took the job from Michigan State to LSU back in 99 after the 99 season here uh will will mel tucker head down to the bayou that's going to be a big storyline to watch here in the coming weeks but you have to expect even if he does take that job he's going to finish out the season at michigan state if michigan state continues to win does that increase his chances of staying or does that decrease his chances of staying that's interesting to watch but with lsu making the move on ed odron at this point in time you'd have to expect that the Tigers, they're going to – the Tigers are probably going to have their guy in place. They probably have somebody in place already that they they feel very confident that they can land. Purdue goes into Iowa City, and the best tweet of the weekend, we beat the number two out of Iowa, Purdue 24, number two, Iowa 7. The Boilermakers rolled into Iowa City and threw for nearly 400 yards – and the Boilers to get a massive upset over the number two Hawkeyes. Of course, a few years ago, you remember that Rondell Moore game in uh, in West Lafayette where they upset the Buckeyes on a Saturday night. This is right up there with that type of upset. Iowa, on the other hand, they could not get the offense going. They did not eclipse the 200-yard mark through the air, 
and managed only 76 yards on 30 rushing attempts. So the Boilers are up to it on both sides of the ball. Suddenly, Purdue, 2-1, and one, they're tied for the lead in the Big Ten West with the Hawkeyes and a Minnesota team, which beat Purdue last week after losing to Bowling Green. Uh, the Mac, the Mac's just pulling some upsets here and there. Purdue football. Like I said, tweet of the weekend, we beat the number two out of Iowa. I thought that was a great one. Uh, Don't rule out the Hawkeyes, though. Iowa could still make a run at a playoff spot if they went out. I would highly doubt that Purdue's winning out here. So this could be a a mild trip up for Iowa. If they went out, get a shot at Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game, very much still could be a playoff team if Iowa gets it together. Nebraska goes up to Minnesota after looking very competitive the last few weeks. But it doesn't matter. They they fall flat on their face to this one ugly affair. The Gophers were ahead the whole. They were constantly one step ahead of this Huskers team. Minnesota ends up winning thirty to twenty three. And after a few good showings, one would have thought the Cornhuskers would go up to Minneapolis and take care of business with really an up and down Gophers team here. Instead, Minnesota takes care of business, frustration mounting in Lincoln. And at some point, the Huskers have to be expected to win these games. You looked good against Michigan State. You played well against Michigan. You played well against Oklahoma. Beat Minnesota, Scott Frost. Come on, man. It's It's got to be frustrating not getting this done if you're a Nebraska fan. Minnesota, in the meanwhile, they, they improved a 2-1 Big Ten play. They have a chance to make a run at the Big Ten West with a three-game stretch coming up against Maryland, Northwestern, and Illinois. So easy to see where they might get the 5-1 in Big Ten play and be a contender in November. Army went to Wisconsin. Uh, You didn't expect much from Army in this one. Wisconsin, though, their offense has not been cooking. Army hung around. They kept it ugly. They did what they do. They only lose by six. Wisconsin 20, Army 14. New week, same story for the Badgers, though. Stout defense paired with an unimpressive offense made the game a lot closer than most Badgers fans would have like would have preferred. Trusting Graham Mertz continues to dwindle as Paul Chris only allowed his quarterback to drop back 15 times in this game, completing only eight passes. Wisconsin, still worth paying attention to, though, because they're two Big Ten losses. They were to Penn State and Michigan, both on the East. So they have they, they can play everyone head-to-head in the West, and if they can win their games head-to-head in the West, and as long as they're tied at the top, they can sneak into the Big Ten title game. Next up for the Badgers, Purdue and Iowa. So some big games coming up for the Wisconsin Badgers. All right, Big 12 action here. TCU goes into Oklahoma, and – Oklahoma may have finally found its groove. Caleb Williams came in for Spencer Rattler in that classic against Texas. Uh, He throws her four touchdowns in this one. The Sooners, they use a 21-point third quarter to run out to a 52-31 to victory over Texas Christian. OU should take care of Kansas and Texas Tech the next two weeks. So before wrapping up with – but they do have a tough stretch down the schedule here. They wrap up with Baylor. Iowa State and Oklahoma State. So the Sooners looks like they're finally hitting their stride. Looks like they're going to get to nine and zero. Baylor, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and the Big T- in the Big Twelve title game still pending for this team. They flirted with disaster enough, but Caleb Williams looks to have put a little pep in their step. And Spencer Rattler projected Heisman number one pick. He was projected to be a lot of things coming in this season. Not looking like he's getting his job back anytime soon. Oklahoma State, on the other hand, they're sticking around, undefeated still. They go down to Texas, 32-24 to over the Longhorns. The Longhorns were looking good to start in this one. They were up 17-3. to They're driving, and all of a sudden, Oklahoma State's defense, they bailed out a sluggish offense. They end up getting a pick six, 85-yard return for a touchdown, and that turned things around. After the pick six, the Cowboys went on a 22-7 to run to close the game. And a second interception from Texas quarterback Casey Thompson ended Texas's hopes of a comeback late in the fourth quarter. And Oklahoma State advances to 6-0 and on the season. Look for Oklahoma State to garner more attention should they survive a trip to Ames this weekend against Iowa State. So if they come out big on that, if they come out with a win on that one, they'll start to get some respect from the playoff committee. BYU goes down to Baylor. 
The Bears, Dave Aranda, continues to impress this season. Nice bounce back year from a tough 2020. Of course, this program was very competitive two years ago in 2019 under Matt Rule before Rule left for the Panthers. But Baylor beats BYU 38 to 24. They ran all over the Cougars, 303 yards rushing and 47 attempts, while BYU was held to 67 yards on the ground. Of course, BYU offensive coordinator ends up going to Baylor in the offseason. It's helping Baylor out. It's paying dividends. The one loss Bears, they stay in the hunt for an outside shot at the playoff and the Big 12 championship here, improving to six and one. Texas, TCU, Oklahoma up next. So we'll find out if Baylor's for real really quick here. Iowa State 33, Kansas State 20. Losses to Baylor and Iowa took the spotlight off this Cyclones team, but the fight in Matt Campbell's, they improved to four and two with a 33 to 20 win over Kansas State this past weekend. Should Iowa State take down Oklahoma State this weekend, they will be in the thick of the Big 12 race heading down the home stretch. And hey, this could be the team, no matter whether they win or lose against Okie State, no one's going to want to see this Iowa State team, no matter what their record is down the stretch. Good ball club. Might have been overhyped as a top 10 team, but. Definitely a good team, and nobody's going to want to play them heading into the stretch. All right, let's head into some key games from the Pac-12. Cal went to Oregon on Friday night, and they might be – the Cal Bears might be the most competitive one-in-five football team in America. Uh, They end up falling to Oregon 24-17 to on Friday night, but the Bears, they took a 17-10 to lead with 13-37 left in the fourth quarter. However, the Ducks answered with back-to-back drives to pull out a 24-17 victory and keep their playoff hopes alive. Cal, lots of close losses to good teams this season. Uh, The bounces go your way sometimes, and sometimes all of the bounces don't. That's what's happening with Cal. They're in the hunt in these games. They're just not closing. So I wouldn't give up on Justin Wilcox in that program yet. They're very competitive this season, just not going their way. All right, let's go out to Utah. The Utes with a 35-20 to 20 win, win over Arizona State. And every time I, – I, I, this Arizona State program has been very interesting under Herm Edwards. And every time it looks like they're ready for that next step, they're going to step up. They, they end up getting the win a few weeks back uh, over UCLA. And it looks like, okay, they're in control of the Pac-12 South. This is the year the Sun Devils are going to get to the Pac-12 title game. They take a tough trip up to Utah. And they stumble. They just don't get it done when they need to. They're up 21-7 at halftime. But ASU gave up four second-half touchdowns and four possessions to Utah. Utah, they were Arizona State's last major hurdle, in my opinion, in the pack to a Pac-12 South crown. And instead, the Utes improved to 3-0 in league play and are now in full control of the South after early losses to BYU and San Diego State. So Utah... Now the team to beat in the Pac-12 South. Another team that's chasing there, UCLA. They went up to Seattle. They played the Washington Huskies, 24-17 Bruins. Uh, They beat Washington up front in this one, 237 yards rushing on 40 attempts. We've seen them beat up other teams in a similar fashion, this UCLA team. Arizona State's lost to Utah, of course. Good for UCLA. Puts them back in the hunt for the Pac-12 South. Now, Now you got Arizona State and UCLA jockeying just behind Utah. But the difference is the Bruins, they get to control what they're doing next. They have matchups against Oregon and Utah in the next two weeks. So that will be big for their season for Chip Kelly's bunch. Stanford goes to Washington State and Stanford, let's put them in the Texas category. Let's put them in the Arizona State category. Every time you think they're going to figure it out, they end up taking a step back here. Good luck figuring out Either one of these teams, too. Washington State's been like that all season. They, they look terrible one week. They look okay another week. Washington State upsets the Cardinal 34 to 31. And they face a three tough three game sketch, stretch coming up here. The Cougars, BYU, Arizona State, and Oregon. The Cougars, they need a little help, but they technically remain alive in the Pac 12 North. Big home win over Stanford. However, the main headline comes after the game. This this uh, past Monday, uh, Nick Rolovich, the coach they had hired from Hawaii, was it was announced that he is going to be released from his duties. Uh, he did not comply with the COVID vaccine mandate, and Washington State has released him of his duties along with a few other assistants. So, a little bit of adversity for this Cougars team. 
that they'll be facing going forward, but we'll see how they react in the coming weeks. Let's wrap it up with the group of five. You had the Cincinnati Bearcats just destroyed Gus Malzahn and UCF, 56-21. to 21. And for those of you who are skeptical about a group of five team claiming a playoff spot, this is the type of result Cincinnati needs to continue to cement their spot in the playoffs. You know people on the committee are having their doubts. But the Bearcats, they're almost a shoo at this point if they continue to win out. They obviously have to go undefeated. What I'm starting to question, though, is if Georgia were to fall, let's say they lose to Florida in the coming weeks here. Let's say Georgia falls. Can the Bearcats make a legitimate claim at number one? I, I think it's very possible you could see a scenario with that. However, they're not going to – they'll get jumped by Oklahoma if Oklahoma stays undefeated most likely. But if Cincinnati continues to win, right now Cincinnati moved up into the number two spot after Iowa's lost. They stay ahead of Oklahoma. I think they deserve that spot. I, I think the Sooners team has not shown that they are that team yet. I'm okay. Oklahoma, earn it. I, I think Oklahoma's got the ability to earn it down the stretch. They got certainly got a stronger schedule. I think the toughest remaining matchup for Cincinnati might be SMU. But I, I think this Oklahoma team, Oklahoma-Cincinnati – could they jockey for the number one spot? Cincinnati, you keep winning like this, and you'll have good argument. They they need to keep up this pace if they want to have an argument. But I would say they deserve a chance to be ahead at this point. The Sooners have been kind of uninspiring. So if they keep playing, if, if Oklahoma plays the way they did against TCU, Oklahoma will make their case. So the Bearcats' remaining schedule, I, I referenced the SMU game, but they have at Navy, at Tulane, versus Tulsa at USF versus SMU, and then at ECU. So four road games, four road games. So chance maybe if they – chance for the Bearcats to slip up or maybe they're a little sharper on the road. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to also mention this one here. Liberty falls to Louisiana Monroe 31-28. to Just from a betting perspective, Terry Bowden and UL Monroe pull the upset over Liberty in this one despite being 31-point underdogs. 31-point underdog won this weekend. That's incredible. Congrats to Louisiana Monroe. Let's wrap up on a couple of Mountain West games. Utah State, 28, UNLV, 24. And I don't have much to share about this game itself. Don't get excited about the game. I just wanted to encourage you to check out UNLV sideline slot machine. Absolutely puts the turnover chain to shame. And <laughs> they're right on the strip playing in Allegiant Stadium, that same stadium the Raiders are now playing in. So the slot machine, the newest thing to college football, got to love it. Uh, Nevada, 34, Hawaii, 17. Really just want to mention this game. Like to check in on top quarterback prospect Carson Strong. He throws for 395 yards in this one, two touchdowns. The Wolfpack, they get the big win late Saturday night over Hawaii. And they're on a crash course with San Diego State for a big matchup in the Western Division of the Mountain West here coming up here in a few weeks, I believe. So Nevada Wolfpack, keep an eye on them out West. Well, that's it for this weekend in college football. Those are the key games I wanted to review. Please stay tuned to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel through the bye week. We'll have plenty of content coming your way. Coming up later this week, I'm going to post an interview that I was able to do with Kevin Kelly. He was at the Pulaski Academy, the head coach that never punts from the Pulaski Academy in Little Rock, Arkansas. Now the head coach at Presbyterian College. I know we've mentioned him on the podcast before here. Uh, having some... Tough stretch. It's a tough stretch right now with Presbyterian. Some mixed results this season. Off to a strong start, but the last several weeks have been pretty tough for Coach up there at Presbyterian. But I wanted to put the interview out to the audience because I, I just wanted you to get a feel for his philosophy. It's very interesting. Everything he does is analytical, and uh, he has reasonings behind everything he does. But it's, it really carries into off the field how they practice, how they lift. Super interesting philosophy from Coach Kevin Kelly. I'll have that posted on the YouTube Read and Reaction channel this week. Thanks again for joining the Read and Reaction podcast. I'm Nick Newton. Have a great day.